hosted by Julissa Arce and presented by Unidos US. Uh, my name is Maribet Navarrete and I am the founder of the Mujerista and Network. The Mujerista, uh, we are the media partner for this season's La Historia Uncovered. And today's conversation explores the history of Latino erasure in the United States. And we'll go deeper into the lack of representation of Latinos and critical race theory. As a platform that's dedicated its space to and its resources to amplifying Latino voices that so rarely are represented in the media and in history or are frequently stereotyped, the types of conversations that are taking place with La Historia Uncovered are exactly why we believed it was important to be involved. So La Historia Uncovered is bringing to the forefront awareness for the issues that are affecting our communities and how and why they are impacting us and by learning and exploring our histories, we can learn from them and have the necessary knowledge to change our futures for the better. Now let's welcome writer, activist, and creator of La Historia Uncovered, Julissa Arce, who will be moderating today's important conversation. Thank you, Maravette, so much. Um, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking your lunch hour if you're on the West Coast and your early evening if you're on the East Coast to be with us today. I have been hosting these conversations, La Historia Uncovered, since last year because I wanted to uncover all the Latino American history that I didn't learn in school. And as I have, I've thought a lot about what not knowing this history took from me and what it could have given me had I had this knowledge and this power of this knowledge as I was growing up in the United States. I am particularly excited to have this conversation about Latino erasure with two of the most forward-thinking people on the issue. Joining me today are Congressman Joaquin Castro, who has been leading the fight for representation of Latinos in Hollywood, in publishing, in history books, and I wasn't born in San Antonio, but I feel like I am from San Antonio as is Congressman Castro. And secondly, is also joining us one of the most sought after scholars, Berkeley professor of racism and class, Ian Haney Lopez, whose books, White by Race, Dog Whistle Politics, Merge Left and others have been really instrumental in my work as a writer and an activist. So welcome Congressman Castro and Professor Lopez. Good to be with you. Thank you so much. Glad to be part of this conversation. Yeah, and um, Ian, you were just telling me before we got started that my questions were very ambitious. So I wanna get right into it so that we can cover as much ground as we possibly can in this in this next 40, um, 45 minutes. And I just wanna remind the audience that if you do have questions, please use the Q&A button. Um, we will have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So I just want to rub, I just want to jump right into it. There, I feel like every time I turn on the TV, there is a new segment about critical race theory, whether it's people on one side who want to ban the teaching of critical race or people on the other side who think it's critically important that um, we teach truthful American history. But I think what is really missing from these conversations um, is is sort of even talking about what is critical race theory, because I think that if we were to ask 10 people who think that it shouldn't be taught, they wouldn't actually be able to articulate what critical race theory actually is. So that's where I want to start um, with you, Professor Lopez. If you could just kind of help us set the ground and, and, and set some definitions as we begin this conversation, if you could tell us what is critical race theory and has the term always caused, caused so much controversy? Is this something new? How did it all get started? So the only thing I want to say is part of the reason your, your questions are so ambitious is, is because you're asking them of a law professor. So like one question <laughs> in 45 minutes, perfect. That's plenty of time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, set a timer. <laughs> yeah. So in some ways, the, the sort of what is critical race theory is important, but in some ways it's not. Like, so if we think about what is critical race theory, it's a way of taking racism seriously that arises in law schools in the 1970s, 1980s. It says, look, racism permeates our society, it permeates our social structures, including things like the marketplace, politics, and law. And also I should add, and this is really important, Critical race theory is really animated by a civil rights spirit of 
trying to be politically engaged and to ameliorate racism and to improve conditions for communities of color, right? So it's, so it's both an analysis and a practice. But again, on another level, it doesn't really matter what critical race theory is, not in the contemporary moment, because what we're seeing is the demonization, the slander of critical race theory. It's all a lie. And the, and the, and the guy, Chris Rufo, who's the primary liar, has said, I'm lying. I'm making this stuff up. I don't really care what the details are. Yes, I understand this is propaganda, but hey, look, it works. Judge me on its effectiveness. Don't judge me on its accuracy. And why is it effective? And here, just, just to say this really clearly, attacks on critical race theory, like attacks on the 1619 project that try and center slavery, like attacks on the Black Lives Matter movement, they're a way of scaring primarily white voters, but not exclusively, with the idea that those of us who are asking for racial justice are instead demanding racial revenge. That mm -hmm. when we say Black Lives Matter, we mean white people don't matter. That when we say critical mm -hmm. race theory, we mean hate white people, right? Now those are mm -hmm. horrible lies, but they're effective. They do scare people. And, that, and this is part of the politics of, of racial fear that is the primary strategy among Republicans and has been for the last 60 years. Hmm. So, so just to kind of, um, I think you're, 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 you're right that it almost doesn't matter because we aren't, because the, the, the attacks on critical race theory are not really attacks about critical race theory, right? They're attacks on everything you just mentioned. But, but understanding, I think for me, it's been important to just understand that critical race theory, I, I kind of feel like I was, I was talking about critical race theory without understanding that what I was talking about was critical race theory, right? Which is that like racism exists, that it is real, that some of our laws have been uh, written in such a way to, um, to systematize racism, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so here, here's this analogy that I've been using to, to get people to understand what critical race theory is. So critical race theory is to race kind of what economics is to spending money, right? Like, okay, we all spend money, but nobody would say, hey, because I spent money today, I fully understand how money in the economy, the marketplace work, right? Nobody would say that. People would think, wow, the economy, that's pretty complex. It, it, it depends on our laws. It responds to government policy. It shapes our consumer culture let's go ahead and, and really understand spending money as part of this, this society shaping dynamic. Race is a society shaping dynamic. It certainly affects interpersonal relationships. So if you've grown up in the United States, you, you spend money, you experience race. But in addition, it's shaping our culture. It's shaped by our government. It distorts our laws. And you can't understand any of that without rigorous study. That's critical race theory, a sort of a rigorous study that takes racism seriously as a society shaping dynamic and that is animated by an ideal of helping move us toward a racially egalitarian society. Hmm. That's great. That, we're gonna take that clip about what is critical race theory. Um, and, <laughs> One of the, you know, one of the things, um, Congressman Castro, that I um, have um, have spent a lot of time over the past few years understanding is where Latinos specifically fit in this context of uh, critical race theory, in this context of racism, where we fit into the conversations about racial justice, and I think that you know there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation about Latino history, um, which leads to creating this sort of fertile ground when even the most basic facts about our community are missing in the public discourse. And I think that there's a real connection between the lack of history and the lack of representation. And you've been doing a lot of work um, around the lack of Latino representation in Hollywood and the media and in other parts of American culture. So can you talk to us about what led you to this work? Like, why is this work important to you? Um, and if you could tell us about what is that work that you're doing? 
Yeah, well, it's great to be with you and with Professor Lopez and uh, everybody who's uh, listening today, on here today. Um, you know, I grew up in San Antonio, uh, just like you, I know, for many years. And I grew up on the deep west side of San Antonio. So the neighborhoods that I grew up in were most of them 90, 95% Mexican-American, very working class. And I realized growing up that the, the history and the narratives that were taught in school, uh, the canon of history, so to speak, and then the images that I would see on television and on screen never quite reflected or lined up with the reality that I was growing up around in an overwhelmingly Mexican-American working class neighborhood, neighborhoods. I moved around four times when I was growing up. Uh, that story that I was living around me and the story and histories of those people and their contributions and the contributions of people like them, their parents and their grandparents to the success and the, the development and the prosperity of the state and the country and really even the city uh, were hardly ever told. Uh, and so I really started to focus on this work of Latino representation across media platforms um, very heavily after what happened in El Paso, Texas, where you had a madman drive 10 hours and killed more than 20 people because he considered them, uh, quote, uh, Hispanic invaders to Texas. And I really asked myself, how does somebody come to believe that? Now, how does somebody get those ideas? I doubt that he had many, you know, knew many people growing up or even as an adult who were Mexican American or who had done the things that he imagined. Um, and it, there are different reasons, but I think two of the primary reasons are the stereotypes that have been cast about the Latino community over the years through American media. And then those stereotypes that are then taken and abused by people in my line of work, abused for political gain very successfully often. Uh, and that is the most dangerous mix that you can get where you get false stereotypes that are then taken and just pounded into the public and abused. And El Paso is the worst iteration of what happens in that dangerous mix. But then also, you know, in, in this work, there was one conversation that really uh, stuck out for me. Uh, we were having uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus was meeting with the Association of American Publishers. And on the call were some of the CEOs of the big publishing companies in the country. And I asked one gentleman who was obviously a very accomplished, ambitious, probably 50 something year old man. I asked him if he could name three Latinos or Latinas who had made significant contributions in American history. In other words, three historical figures. Uh, and he helmed a company that was a large, besides publishing fiction and nonfiction, a large publisher of textbooks for schools. And he thought about it for five or 10 seconds. And then he finally said, um, you know, no, I can't. Uh, and that to me, uh, the sad thing is, I think if you asked probably 80 or 90% of Americans the same question, because Latinos have been written out of American history textbooks for the most part, and even state history textbooks, I think if you asked 80 or 90% of Americans that question on the fly, you would get probably the same answer. And finally, what that represents is a very dangerous void in narrative. Americans do not know who Latinos are. They do not know who Latinos are. They don't understand where we fit into American society. They don't associate us generally with any time period in American history. And they don't know who among us has been instrumental in the success, the development, the prosperity of the country, and the development of different fields of work, whether it's entrepreneurship or politics uh, or labor or whatever field you might pick. And that narrative being missing uh, is, I think, it's dangerous and it's a tragedy as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think I, um, I'm right there with you in terms of uh, El Paso really bringing up a lot of questions um, and and in some ways, a really big, a really sort of big revelation for me, which was like, it doesn't matter how much time we spend learning to speak English and getting an education and getting a good job, when some people in this country will view us and continue to view us as invaders, no matter how many generations we've spent living in this country and contributing to this country. Um, so, so, so thank you for that. And thank you so much for the work that, that, um, that you're doing. You know, I, I want to bring it back um, 
to, you know, and kind of tie these things together of the lack of teaching, I keep saying truthful American history, a history that includes Latinos and our contributions, and so much of it being written out, I think purposely written out of, of history books. And you mentioned earlier that critical race theory really also has this sort of um, civil rights lens to it. And when I think about sort of ethnic studies and the history of ethnic studies and wanting to teach ethnic studies, they also kind of are very much rooted in the civil rights movement and people um, uh, you know, making, making a push for our history to be taught. So I'm wondering how, how does, how does teaching ethnic studies fit into this conversation about, about critical race theory? Is that something that has motivated some of the attacks? Um, what can you tell us about that? Super interesting conversation and really important it, in part because, or, or at least I, I, I wanna give a conflicted answer, um, partly because I'm, I'm increasingly conflicted about how we teach ethnic studies. Mm. So to provide some background, I've been, teaching race in American law for over 25 years at the University of California, Berkeley. And I've always been associated with critical race theory and was one of the first to really bring Latinos into the fold of critical race theory. And there's some really important contributions. Like on the one hand, taking seriously the history of racial oppression of Latinos is enormously important to locating ourselves in the sort of trajectory of this country. On the other, looking at how Latinos have been treated as a racial group is incredibly important for understanding how race works for whites and for African-Americans as well. Because I think in the history of Latinos, but also in our individual lives, many of us have bounced between different racial identities. And likewise, the Latino community. The Latino community, or at least the sort of more middle-class elements of it through the middle of the 20th century insisted they were white. And then the young activists after the Chicano power movement said, no, we're brown. That, there, there's a, an incredibly important insight there. Race is socially produced. Our racial identities are not fixed by nature, nor is the racial identity of white people fixed by nature, nor is the identity of African-Americans fixed by nature. We look different depending on geography and descent and our parents, but the idea that we're different races, that's socially produced. And so now here's why I'm a little bit conflicted about what we've been doing with ethnic studies, what I've been doing as a teacher who's been focused on race and racism. We started telling a story about race and racism in which these were single access discussions, racial, hierarchy only. And we divorce them, A, from other axes of oppression like patriarchy, but also we divorced racism from class, from competition yeah. over jobs and wealth. And I think that that's distorted our view because if we, and, and, and again, we can really see this with Latinos. Why do so many people demonize undocumented immigrants? Partly it's just a racial story, a story of, of fear and degradation, but partly it's an economic strategy. To the, and it has been for over a hundred years to the extent that there's a large population of people who are undocumented and without legal protection and cannot organize, they're much more easily exploited. And that's been the strategy in particular of the California agribusiness for over a hundred years. That is, we are simul when we talk about race, we should also be talking about class. And too often we tell a race only story, or if we talk about class at all, a class only story. When what we have to understand is for every group in this country, not only for Latinos, but for African-Americans, race arises in the context of slavery, a class-based labor exploitation system. White identity arises in the context of labor competition, a way to distinguish between different sorts of unfree labor, right? I mean, like they're always tied together. And so one of the things that I would love to see for, from critical race theory, from, from ethnic studies, and certainly in our political organizing 
is an effort to fuse our conversations about racism and also about class war, the sort of class war that shifts wealth to the economic stratosphere while deeply exploiting some groups and pitting all groups against each other. Hmm. Hmm. That's so interesting because yeah, I think it is sort of, it is conflicting because a, a part of me feels like we've never even gotten to the point of understanding the Latino experience in, in the racial categories uh, and understanding our place, right? Like, I think most of us don't really even understand that we were considered legally white because of the Mexican-American War. And as a compromise of war, the United States gave us citizenship, not because they wanted to, but because they had to, right? And, and what did that do going forward for our community when we were considered legally white, but, but socially, we were never really accepted as white. So um, I kind of feel like we haven't even gotten to that part of it, but I totally understand the need to look at it through through a racial lens. But I do wonder whether one sort of weighs more on the other. Like I, I was just remembering um, a story that I read on um, in a book, how I think it was either how the Irish became white or working towards whiteness, like one of those two books where um, it talks about, um, you know, this sort of like uh, undercut for labor and a lot of um, white European immigrants uh, being against emancipation because they didn't want uh, uh, freed enslaved people to take over the, the market, right? And, 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 and Frederick Douglass saying, well, anytime any of you wanna take my job at the, uh, my old job at the plantation, it's it's open, you know. I hear it's open. Um, so I, so I, I so that is sort of a really interesting conversation. Um, uh, Congressman Castro. So part of what part of what you know I would love to see is for for there to to even be this sort of study of um, ethnic studies and Latino studies to be more um, prevalent in in schools in, in Texas, for yeah. example, K through twelve. Um, K through 12 public schools are about 52% Latino. And, uh, and, but we've seen in Texas, a slew of whether it's um, Governor Abbott signing a new law that really limits the ways in which teachers can, can teach uh, about race and about um, Texas history, whether it's um, you know, um, anti-critical race theory conservatives winning elections on the school board and really pushing for there to be less Latino studies, less ethnic studies. From your, from your line of work as, uh, as an elected official, what can we do? What is being done to ensure that our children are learning our own history, you know, it might not be perfect yet because we might need to incorporate it sort of like the class element to it and, and all these other elements to it, but just kind of on a, on a big, bigger, broader level, um, what, what can we do? What is being done? Because I, I think it's clearly important that our children learn our history. Yeah, and I think what's strange about all of this, you know, all of a sudden this outrage about critical race theory uh, was first that it seemed to come out of nowhere. And I'll be honest with you, yeah, I was at Stanford in the mid 1990s at undergrad. I graduated in 1996. And then I was at law school at Harvard. And those were some of the last times that I can remember fully thinking about critical race theory as a student back then. And I remember on campus, there was a debate about it. Uh, but then you know, I went back home to San Antonio into Texas, where uh, when I was running for office and even you know, ethnic studies was just allowed to be taught in Texas really in the last five years, but really started coming into schools in the last three or four years. You know, so critical race theory is an analysis, right? Well, you don't get to the analysis until you actually include different groups in the teaching of history, right? And then eventually you get to an analysis. Um, so that's what's been so strange. And I know that part of this debate played out in Virginia uh, where you know, the senators made the case that's not even, you're not even teaching critical race theory because it, that's been the province of uh, mostly graduate, but also some undergraduate you know, programs. Um, but yes, it's important to include people's history and it's important to com include communities' histories so that they have a sense of place and belonging in, in American society and in, in their home states, in their communities. Uh, you know, 
when we had that conversation with the publishers, the last thing that I, I said was, you know, imagine if you're an eight-year-old Latina girl uh, growing up and never reading about anybody who sounds like you or looks like you uh, or comes from where you're from that had any important role in developing anything in the history of the country or in American society. What does that do to your horizons and what you believe is possible for yourself, for your family, for your community, for all of it? Uh, and so there have been efforts and there was actually, that's what's weird in Texas also, there was this bill that Greg Abbott, the governor supported and spearheaded the legislature passed that said, you basically have to do this whataboutism or both sidesism. And that led actually very dramatically about a month ago now, three weeks ago to a school uh, in, um, I wanna say South Lake in Texas, uh, teaching, trying to teach both sides of the Holocaust uh, because of the state law that had been passed. You know, so that law was passed. There was actually another law to teach about anti-Semitism at the same time in the same legislative session. And then another bill that got through the House of Representatives but failed in the Senate that would have helped to expand ethnic studies. You know, so you know, Texas, the legislative process in Texas is fairly neurotic, um, but there has been this void in making sure that the communities that make up Texas, uh, that their histories are taught about in Texas history and American history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I mean, before, um, Sorry, I don't know if that was me. Um, before we got, before we were, we were, we were, we had started. We were talking about um, how Latinos view ourselves um, racially, and that's one thing that I found really fascinating from um, a survey that um, Professor Lopez you you conducted. And I, the, the original question I wanted to ask you was you know, that so much of our history has been obscured and sometimes we make the same mistakes because we don't know our history. And in one of your books, Racism Montreal, you tell a story of how Mexican Americans became brown and proud. Um, but now you've conducted a, a, a recent survey where a large portion of Latinos today don't see themselves as people of color. But you also mentioned that they don't necessarily see themselves as white. And how so how has latinos racial identity hindered or um progressed uh the coalition building efforts ac across racial lines can you can you help us make sense of this um because yes. i think part of the reason we don't view ourselves as people of color is because we don't know uh yeah. you know the systemic oppression of our people so so let's before we get to that which obviously I really want to talk about, but before, you know, like what professor doesn't want to talk about their research, but before we get to that, <laughs> let's go back to this conversation you were having, because it's so important along with you, you along with, with Congressman Castro, it's so important. What is ethnic studies doing and why is there so much opposition to it? So what ethnic studies is doing is giving people a critical lens on American history and helping people locate themselves and to think about group relations. Um, uh, and one thing we know is that the more people engage with how racial oppression has worked in this country, the more politically progressive they become because they begin to say to themselves, oh, wait a minute, this American dream, it hasn't been realistic for many, many people. Um, wait a minute, um, the way things are organized now, that didn't just happen. We actually structured it through our government and what government can has done, it can do anew and in a way that's more equitable. Um, it allows people to say, oh, we really do need to create a sense of linked fate and to reject mm -hmm. sort of how, right? right. So, what, so what happens with people who've gone through the critical education offered by college and especially ethnic studies, and even at the high school level is, they become more politically progressive in that, in that classic Stephen Colbert, you know, like reality has a liberal bias. The more you know about reality, the more you're like, hey, we could build a just society. We have the power to do it because mm -hmm. look at all the work we've done to build an unjust society. Why don't we use that mm -hmm. power and, and, and work for all of us, right? So when you see attacks on ethnic studies in, for example, Arizona, where 
students going through Mexican American studies in Arizona had higher high school graduation rates and higher college matriculation rates than the ones who weren't. Like it was working, it was really yeah. helping these kids join and participate actively as sort of members of the polity and the Arizona legislature destroyed it. And the Texas legislature is trying to destroy ethnic studies, why? These are Republican controlled legislatures who in general are hostile to critical thinking about how society actually works, but are especially critical of things like ethnic studies that help people position themselves in terms of a realistic appraisal of the American dream and a realistic demand that things work better, right? And I think that that's a large part of what's happening. Now, here's something else that ha that's happening and that, that, that I'm gonna kind of segue. A lot of the most politically active Latinos are people like you and I, who've gone through that education about how racism has worked, have internalized an identity that says we are part of a community of color that has long faced racial oppression. And we base a lot of our activism, a lot of our political demands, a lot of our language on this self-conception as members of a community of color who should, who should seek power with other communities of color, in particular with African-Americans, and who should make demands on white society. The problem is that's only about one in four Latinos who have this worldview. Mm -hmm. Many Latinos lacking this sort of education, lacking this sort of perspective are really thinking to themselves, they're really sort of asking pretty basic questions. Who am I in this society? Are my kids gonna make it? And, and now think about this, especially from the point of view of immigrants. Right? And, I, and I say this thinking about um, my mother as an immigrant from El Salvador. Did she come to this country? Did she leave her family behind? Did she make a fresh start where she didn't speak the language so that she could raise her two sons in a society which would always revile them, hate them, demean them, mm. and limit their horizons by racism? Hell no, that's not why she came to this country. She was not going to accept that story. She wanted a story in which the American dream was possible for her children and all the sacrifices she, she made were worth it, right? And we're, so when we try, and this is part of what I was doing with last summer, um, working with Equis Research and with Tori Gavito at Way to Win, when we started have hold and focus groups with Latinos and we said to them, we tested out this idea, you know, hey, Donald Trump, he's racist against Latinos and Yes, he's beloved by millions of Americans. They're racist against Latinos too. We need to build power with other communities of color who are also hated by white people. Man, that message did not work politically, right? And so it worked It worked with those of us who've gone through ethnic studies and who understand ourselves as people of color. But again, that's one in four. It did not work with most Latinos. Now, the important thing to say here is Lots of us who think that we're people of color are very dismissive of other Latinos who don't agree. We're very dismissive. If, if, if we encounter a Latino who, does, who doesn't agree with our analysis that we're an oppressed community, oppressed racial group, we tend to dismiss them as vendidos or as coconuts, like they're trying to pass. That's not true either. When mm -hmm. I did this polling, Lat Latinos might say, hey, we're not a racial group akin to African-Americans but they simultaneously expressed very high levels of pride in being Latino and very high levels of agreement with the statement that their success depended on the success of other Latinos. In yeah. other words, they, they weren't ashamed of being Latinos and they weren't trying to disaffiliate. They weren't trying to leave the group behind. They were super proud of being Latino, very connected to other Latinos. They just didn't want a story in which they were racially oppressed and their children would never be able to join the mainstream. So mm -hmm. when instead we said, some people try and divide us by race, but when we build power with others, no matter what they look like or where they come from, we can make sure this country works for every working family, white, black, and brown. That was the most popular message with all Latinos. And I should add with, with, uh, uh, with African-Americans and with, and with white communities as well. Hmm. That's so 
fascinating. Uh, this whole, I mean, I have to, I, I started reading the, the, I definitely read sort of like the summary of the report and now I want to go back and really uh, analyze the rest of it because um, I mean, I, I mean, I think you're right. You, you know, I, I don't think that I always thought um, the way that I do today. I didn't always, you know, I, I did sort of have this idea that um, I, mean, I, I didn't even call myself Latina. You know, I used to call myself Hispanic because, and I used to like be like, "Ooh, Latino, that sounds so like whatever." You know, and it, I did kind of go through this transformation of understanding like why I don't want to be called Hispanic, why like I am Latina, why I am Mexican. Um, so that's so interesting. And uh, Congressman Castro, so you know, um, one of the things that Professor Lopez was talking about was sort of like the mainstream, right? And and like Latino parents maybe wanting their kids to become part of the mainstream. And I think that there's still this idea that there is the like what, what I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to the to the issue of Latino representation in Hollywood and how important that is to changing the narrative, not just of how other people see us, but most importantly of how we see ourselves. And so I'm wondering in the work that you're doing to increase Latino representation in Hollywood, how that sort of plays out of like can Latinos, I mean, in my mind, Latinos are mainstream. You know, like there, like I don't think that we need to change to become the mainstream. Like we already are uh, mainstream. But in in the work that you're doing specifically around Latino representation in Hollywood, because I do think that has so many implication, and it has also has transformational power. So how do you see that playing out in that particular piece of the work that you're doing? Well, I think that um, Hollywood, the media, American media, and Hollywood in particular is still the main image defining and narrative creating institution in American society. And it's how many Americans get their sense of who other Americans are without ever meeting them personally. Uh, now I will say that the tech community and social media are quickly catching up mostly because of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, but I would still put Hollywood up there as the main image defining and narrative creating institution. And so to me, uh, making sure that Latinos and Latinas are well represented in, in the entertainment industry means that with better representation becomes more accurate portrayals and also more Latino stories that are being told that are fundamental American stories. And all of that is in service of making sure that we close that void in narrative, uh, that black hole. Uh, because if we don't have a hand in helping to define ourselves or in defining ourselves, then you're essentially allowing some other institution or others who don't know your community to define you, to stereotype you. And that's again, when it becomes dangerous because those stereotypes are abused by other people in power uh, to make your life even worse. Yeah, you um you recently um there was there was rec a recent uh, U.S. government of accountability office report on the longstanding lack of representation of Latinos in Hollywood. Um, what 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 were some of the um, findings of that report? And uh, as an elected official, what are some of the strategies that you have at your disposal? Some of the tools at your disposal to try to rectify this issue. Sure. So we requested myself, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, some members of the uh, Oversight and Government Reform Committee in the House of Representatives, including the chairwoman, Carolyn Maloney, requested uh, earlier in the year of the Government Accountability Office that they do a study on this issue of Latino underrepresentation and exclusion in the media industry. And so it looked at different parts of the media, but what it generally found was the media industry uh, is much more exclusive to Latinos, only including about 12% of Latinos as its workforce versus other American industries that as a whole taken together uh, are, are Latinos make up about 18% uh, of that workforce. And in particular, you have higher up positions, C-suite positions, uh, producers, directors, things like that, where Latinos are very, very, very woefully underrepresented. There's also been, that's a government study there's also been a great work done at USC and UCLA on this topic as well. And, and let me just say this, because I think it's very important, you know, because when I started doing this work, uh, particularly about Hollywood and doing it out of Congress, 
Uh, there were even some of my colleagues who I think had a sense of, well, you know, why do we care about this? What is it? You know, that's kind of floppy stuff compared to working on immigration or healthcare or education. Obviously, very important work and very important topics and subjects. But I see this issue of representation and portrayal as foundational to the Latino community. Because if you are continually uh, over stereotyped, right, or stereotypes define your identity in American society, then that doesn't only affect, you know, which parts some Latina actress can get who's going and auditioning for a role. That affects everybody who walks around, however they may identify as a Latino or Latina with brown skin or Spanish surname or whatever it may be, when they go and apply for a job as an accountant, as, as a firefighter, uh, at a bank, as a teacher, that affects, that, that projection of a stereotype is affecting all of us, regardless of what line of work we're in. And that's a big part of the reason that I've taken it head on in Congress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This was just reminding me of, you know, even, even like things like getting asked to uh, bring someone a drink when you're like a guest at a function or at a restaurant. That's you know, happened which, to me, yeah, a few times. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's yeah. like, mm, I'm not even, no, I don't work here and, I, and I, I'm not even wearing what the rest of the waiters are wearing. Like I'm wearing a fancy dress. Um, why are you asking me to bring you something? Um, but I think that, you know, I think that that's sort of um, like a, a, a way that, that this sort of shows up, exactly what you're saying, that when the consciousness of, uh, of people in the United States is to view Latinos in one way, it really does sort of affect everything else. Um, I am going to take some questions. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to just float this other idea. So I, I really applaud Congressman Castro for taking the lead on trying to put pressure on these different industries to include the representation of Latinos and, and also completely agree that these are very, very powerful industries in terms of shaping the public imagination. And we have to insist that they tell stories with which you know, that reflect positively on us with which we can identify. There's another, there's another way of telling this story though that I'd also like to encourage. And that is the story of cross-racial solidarity. Because we've really sort of defaulted to a notion that is promoted by the right, that racial groups are basically in conflict with each other. And that we're all on different teams and that we best study the history and identify most closely with our own team. But I think about people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, who self-consciously organized a cross-racial labor movement in the fields in California, making an effort to bring in with Latinos also Filipino Americans, saying oh, it's only through cross-racial solidarity that we're going to succeed. Or I think about um, an earlier figure Josefina Fiedro de Bright in Los Angeles in the 1930s and 1940s. She, she built bridges not only between Latino day laborers, but Hollywood, right? Like there's like all of these cross racial mm -hmm. cl cross class movements that are so important. I think another story, Piti Tomas, who, who was an Afro Latino who wrote the book Down These Mean Streets. It's a story about being Latino being black, trying to figure out the connections, trying to recognize the shared humanity, fighting anti-black racism among Latinos. Those are the stories that we also ought to be telling because I really do think Latinos, we are in a sense multiracial in what we look like. We mm -hmm. need to sort of promote this idea that is not just good for Latinos, but is good for America. Yeah. that our success depends on the success of people from other racial groups and that the ideal is not resting within the four corners of our narrow racial community but building power and connection and a, and, and a sense of joy and curiosity with people across racial lines and i think that that's a story that hollywood almost never tells aside from sort of like white savior movies right but but it, it really ought to be Right, it's like we're all in this together. Let's build power together. Yeah, uh, Congressman Castro, I don't know no, if, you, if there's anything you, you'd want to add to that. No, I think that's absolutely right, and I think that there is more power in that kind of solidarity 
And you know, as we've approached this issue in Congress, for example, uh, it was when I was making the request last year, for example, for the House Judiciary Committee to hold a hearing on this issue, uh, I approached the Congressional Black Caucus and KPAC, which is the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus. And, and the two heads of those caucuses joined me in requesting this uh, because it's an issue that affects all of us. Yeah, exactly. And I think some of the other, um, I mean, I think part of part of learning the history for me has also been learning about the ways in which we have worked together in the past across racial groups and both learning from their wins and also learning from the mistakes that were made in the past and how we um, conducted ourselves and the things that we said sort of behind closed doors and uh, and really kind of rooting out that anti-Blackness and anti-Indigenous sentiment that very clearly is present in our community. Um, so I think, you know, we can have a whole other conversation about the erasure within the erasure of our community, um, right? But there, but there has been incredible ways. I, I'm thinking about um, the, uh, the Los Siete, uh, a group of a group of Latino um, kids who were who were wrongly accused in the '70s, and how the Black Panthers came to speak out against that injustice. And um, you know, Felix Tijerina, who uh, worked also with Black Panthers, and um, the United Farm Workers that led coalitions uh, for the People's March and working with Martin Luther King. And so, and so historically there's actually been quite a bit of collaboration between African-American communities and Latino communities. And I think so many of those stories have been lost so that we think that we've never worked together. Um, and that's just not that's just not true because we have worked together. And um, you know, a lot of the work that I do, a lot of the activism work that I do certainly is um, across uh, racial groups. And, um, and I, it's not just, uh, pretty worse to say that we're stronger together, but but truly um, that has that has shown up. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a quick look at these questions because there are a lot of questions, uh, and I'm only gonna take a couple. Um, uh, okay, this is this is interesting. Okay. There is a swell among Gen Z calling others no sabo kids if they don't speak perfect Spanish. I think it's so integral um, teaching about our history and how so many parents who are first generation made it to a point to ensure their kids spoke English first and they didn't want their kids to get into trouble like they did. How do you think we can combat the continued shaming of our community by our community? Sure, I'll, I, I, I think we don't talk about it enough. Um, you know, when my, grand, my grandmother came to the United States around 1922, and she came as an orphan, she was six or seven years old. And at the time that she came, uh, there were still signs in Texas establishments that said, no dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans allowed. And for a long period of time in, te in Texas, speaking Spanish in school was illegal. Uh, it was statutorily illegal. And so, kids were punished if they spoke Spanish in an effort to force them to learn English and speak in English. And so you literally had a, like a generation and a half of, of mostly Mexican Americans, but Latinos in Texas who had a language and partially a culture beaten out of them. I mean, literally beaten out of them. Uh, and so oftentimes the language didn't get passed on in the same way. And that and the tendency as we've seen over the, throughout the course of US history uh, for language to start to fade over generations. Although, by the way, some other ethnic groups in American history also suffered the same fate of being punished when they spoke their languages in public schools. Um, and so, you know, for example, so my Spanish, you know, is like, I don't speak Spanish great, right? Uh, and, uh, and I've had people ask me about, kind of derisively, oh, you don't speak Spanish, why don't you speak Spanish? And I think people ask that without a sense of the history of Texas and kind of the generations and how they grew up. Um, and there's this sense that you're supposed to hang on to that native language forever, right? And, and look, it would be wonderful. I'd love to be able to speak Spanish perfectly fluently and so forth. Um, but I also think that, that there's a lot of room for us to talk about the history and what led people to where they are now. 
Yeah. So in my, in, in my own life, I, I worked at a law firm for one summer and um, um, many of the secretaries were Latinas and I would greet them in Spanish in, in the morning, buenos dias, and, went, and then one finally said, please don't speak Spanish to me. The, mm. the, you know, I, the, it, it undercuts my professional credibility. And it, she, what she meant was, or to put different language on it, just as there's a lot of racism against Mexicans and other Latin Americans, a lot of negative value is put on Spanish. It's seen as a degraded language compared to, for, for instance, the social status one gains by speaking, let's say, French or German. Right? So it, th there's an effort to, to degrade, to diminish, to demean the speaking of Spanish. So in that sense, it's incredibly important that we express pride, that we build pride in Spanish, in the beauty of the language, in the imagery, in the values embedded within it, incredibly important. But here's something that we really need to be cautious about. We're human beings. Human beings are really attracted to building their status. You can build status mm -hmm. in positive ways by helping lift others up and making connections with them you can build status by tearing others down. And mm. we see that even within the Latino community that some of us try and build our status by tearing others down. And so we, we create these sort of tests of authenticity um, who's most closely connected with X culture, who's most fluent in Spanish, who's darkest. And what we've done is we've taken hierarchies that are ugly, light is better than dark, um, American and assimilated is better than having a connection to la our, our home countries. Um, English is better than the Spanish. And rather than repudiate the hierarchies, rather than reject them, we flipped them. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to build up our own status by tearing other people down. That's what we're fighting. And we should fight it in yeah. our community just as we fight it in society at large. The ideal is where we build connections with others. We build excitement and joy in difference, in learning and experiencing how other people interact with the world and the values that they bring with them, including all of the wonderful things in Spanish, right? Like that's the ideal. And that's the ideal that we have to be careful. We ourselves in fighting for justice for our communities don't violate by trying to tear other people down. I, I don't I don't even want to speak after that. Like that's it. <laughs> no, but but thank you, um, thank you so much. I mean, I have I have so many more questions that I could ask of of of, of both of you, and um, I I've learned so much, uh, not just in this time that we've spent together, but from you know from from other conversations we've had, private conversations that we've had, private conversations and discussions about these things from the books you all have written. Um, and I I feel um, so much more empowered to uh, to take this knowledge and, and and continue to have these conversations. By no means is this conversation over. I'm sure there are many things that we did not cover. Um, and so I just want to um, remind the audience that we didn't cover everything. Um, but we do encourage you to um, to continue to learn about this issues, to continue to learn about the history. For me, learning that history has helped me to reject those hierarchies, to reject assimilation. Um, and I think you know everyone here knows or, um, that 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 is the topic of my next book: the rejecting of this assimilation and rejecting of these hierarchies. Um, and as I said, so much of the work that you all have done has been instrumental um, in my writing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the audience um, for joining us. We will be sending out a follow-up email with additional resources um, of where you can learn more of how you can continue. Um, your education on this on these issues um, and a recording of the of, of this talk if you want to share it with friends. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Castro. Thank you, Professor Lopez. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good to be with you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful Bye. conversation. Thank you.